it's time to introduce our keynote speaker, Cindy Domingo. Uh, when I first began to make the notes to introduce my dear friend and one of my personal heroines, uh, what came to mind as a kind of halia or remembrance are the many Kauaian mo'olelo, which celebrate how younger siblings or students evolve to become as powerful as their older siblings or their teachers through assuming challenges, defeating forces of evil, standing up for those who have been abused, such as in the saga of Pele, the fire goddess, and her younger sister, Hiyaka, the healer of lava. After it's cooled, she goes through a metamorphosis through her journey to get Lohiao for her sister. And in the, the romance of Laie Kavai, which was recently staged by our Hawaiian theater department at Kennedy Theater, uh, they have the exploits of Kahala o Mapuana, who also transcends and becomes a powerful force and a leader um, uh, in the government. So uh, this came to me because of the role and challenges that Cindy Domingo um, stepped up to assume as the younger sister of the Filipino patriot and Seattle labor leader and martyr, Somi Domingo, um, and her her struggle to lead uh, for the effort and the organization for social justice for her brother and Jean Viernes uh, transformed her into the leader that she is today. Uh, Selmy and Domingo Viernes, for those of you who don't know, were both officers of the Alaska Cannery Workers Union, ILWU Local 37 in Seattle, and they were assassinated by the dictatorship of the President Ferdinand Marcos with the backing of the U.S. government in 1981. Silmi, Jean, and Cindy were all members of the Katipunan Namangan Democratico in Filipino, or KDP, Union of Democratic Filipinos, an organization working for social justice of Filipinos in the Philippines and the U.S., and working in opposition to the Ferdinand Marcos dictatorship. I and my husband at the time, Dean Aligado, as members of the KDP, met and worked with Selmi, Jean, and Cindy to educate members here in Hawaii, in ILW Local 142, to also take a stand against the Marcos government. Um, we worked with Aquan Makarath and Guy Fujimura, Mel Chang, Leonard Hoshijo, and uh, at the convention of the International ILW in Honolulu in 1981, uh, Selmi and Jean uh, succeeded in having the influential maritime union uh, pass a resolution uh, critiquing the Marcos government, uh, seeking to investigate more the, what the Marcos government and its abuses were about, and um, did have the support of ILWU 142 through the work of Aquan and Guy. This important action drew the dangerous attention of the Marcos government to Jean and Selmi. Their work to reform the corrupt practices of the previous leaders of the mostly Filipino ILW Locals 37 in Seattle made them target of gangster elements. A convergence of these interests from within the Philippines across to Seattle resulted in a contract to assassinate these young leaders in June of 1981. Undaunted by the brutal murder of Selmi and Jean, Cindy Domingo rose to lead her family and the KDP uh, in a national long struggle of justice uh, forming the Committee for Justice for Domingo and Viernes. And the um, national organization uh, continued to give attention to the criminal suits that, were, that eventually faced the gangsters who murdered Selmi and Jean in jail. But they didn't stop there. They also filed really um, uh, precedent-setting civil suits that confirmed in the courts that the dictatorship of the Ferdinand Marcos was responsible for the assassinations. And the court assessed millions of dollars in payment to the families of Domingo and Dearness. Cindy uh, Domingo has an MA in Philippine history from Goddard College. She is the co-editor of a book on the KDP and has contributed a chapter in a book about six women in the anti-Marcos movement, two from the US and four from the Philippines, including herself. And both books are projected to be published next year in what is now gonna be the 30th anniversary of the overthrow of the Marcos government. Um, 
Yes. <laughs> and my daughter was only eight years old. <laughs> she came to all of our rallies <laughs> and held signs. Um, Cindy has worked in politics to elect progressive and especially people of color at various levels of government, beginning with the Rainbow Coalition in the 1980s. She is currently Chief of Staff to King County Council Member Larry Gossett. She is responsible for budget to, uh, related items, items in the area of impact of the economic crisis on vulnerable communities of color, women, children, and families in the area of human services, domestic violence, employment, and transit services. Cindy Domingo is currently the chair of the board of directors of Legacy of Equality Leadership and Organizing, or LILO, an organization which develops leadership of those who have been marginalized in society. And she will share with us the strategy of local organizing with an emphasis on political education and solidarity networks across borders. Le legacy of leadership, equality, organizing, four decades of organizing across the divides in Seattle. I give you Cindy Domingo. This is actually my first PowerPoint. <laughs> you would think at my age I have done more. <laughs> so first of all, thank you, Davy, for that wonderful introduction. And I want to say what an honor this is to be the guest speaker of the dinner tonight that honors such an important woman in yours and really all of our history. I say that our history because as Davy said, Aquan McElrath is a woman that I have heard about for many years dating back to the 1970s when Daviana and Dean Alligato were part of the KDP. Aquan was the key person who connected this new generation of leftists to those that came before them. Dean said in an email that after I wrote him about being a speaker tonight, that it was Aquan who introduced the KDP people to Carl Damaso and other leftists from Kauai, Molokai, and the Big Island. It was Aquan and Carl who educated the KDP on the role of the left in the labor movement and the Filipino community. For us radical Filipinos, this was an important link to our past, a history that we never learned about, but experiences that we could build upon the KDP became known for its leadership in the fight for democracy in the Philippines and its role in leading US-based movement against the then dictatorship of Ferdinand and Emil de Marcos. Aquan was an ally in that struggle against the dictatorship and helped us on one of our most important endeavors. In May 1981, Salmi Domingo, my brother, and Jean Baroness, officers of the Alaska Cannery Workers Union, ILWU Local 37, based in Seattle, Washington, came to the ILWU International Convention in Hawaii. And as Davy said, they presented a resolution to send an ILWU investigating team to the Philippines to look at the struggle for workers' rights and labor conditions under the Marcos dictatorship. This investigating team would eventually lay the basis for the ILWU to hopefully condemn the Marcos dictatorship, making the ILWU the first labor union to take such a position. That resolution passed when Local 142, with the invaluable help of Aquan and Carl, voted to support the resolution. But little did we know that that resolution would be a milestone in the fight against the dictatorship. Little did we know that the resolution would trigger an international murder conspiracy resulting in the murders of Salmi and Jean less than one month later on June 1st, 1981. We remember that hardship, and even though it has been over 30 years, Davy and Dean both remember Aquan speaking so eloquently at the memorial here in Hawaii that was held in honor of Salmi and Jean after their deaths. My niece, a few years, interviewed Aquan, and she spoke 
about how moved she was about the work that her father, Salmi, and Jean did at the time at the convention and in fighting for the working class both here in the United States and in the Philippines. People like Aquan, who came to be known for their social activism and advocacy for working class people here and abroad, were the inspiration of our organization, LILO. But just like here, the activists of the 60s and 70s had to search hard for the radical left that were persecuted in the 1950s for being communists. But just like here, we found those people in Seattle, people like Chris Salvis, former president of the Cannery Workers Union who was living in Chinatown in a hotel, Josephine Patrick, a former member of the Communist Party of the USA who organized Filipino farm workers, and John Coughlin, a lawyer who fought against the deportation of the Filipino trade unionists in the 1950s during the McCarthy era, all contemporaries of Carlos Bulasan, all who fought for the working class under the harshest of conditions. All of these working class heroes have laid the basis for an organization like LILO, for all of these people fought for our civil and human rights. Last year marked the 50th anniversary of the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And if you watch TV this past week, you know it was the 50th anniversary of the march in Selma. And that was also a result of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It was also this groundbreaking federal legislation that outlawed discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin that laid the basis for the founding of LILO. LILO was founded in 1973 and will celebrate its 42nd anniversary in June. Originally founded as a law office by three organizations of color and called the Northwest Labor and Employment Law Office, LILO today stands as a political organization, and as we say, a political organization that just happens to have a nonprofit status granted by the government and now is called LILO, a legacy of leadership, equality, and organizing. But while the nature of LILO's work has changed from a law office to a grassroots workers' rights organization, its mission and principles remain the same. LILO's mission reads, LILO strives to empower low-income workers of color, recent immigrants, and women workers to assert their rights, improve their working conditions, and gain a voice in their workplaces, their trade unions, and communities in the U.S. and across the globe. Our principles are one, people of color, women, and ordinary workers like you and I should always speak for ourselves. Two, we strive to win racial, economic, and social justice and oppose all forms of exploitation and domination related to our race, class, gender, sexual orientation, age, national origin, culture, and ability. Three, the people's struggles both home and abroad are interrelated, often with a common enemy and common vision for economic and social justice. We commit to support our common struggles with concrete action and acts of solidarity. And lastly, the human rights of the poorest and most exploited must always be placed at the center of our work and our passion for change. These principles and mission statement have guided our work over these last four decades. As I stated, LILO was founded by three workers' organizations of color, the United Construction Workers Association, the Alaska Cannery Workers Association, and the United Farm Workers of Washington. Their aim in coming together was to use the 1964 Civil Rights Act to fight discrimination, particularly in the area of employment discrimination. In doing so, LILO became a dynamic, multiracial organization based in Seattle of black, Asian, and Latino workers that made long-lasting improvements in the areas of improving the conditions and rights of workers and today we continue with that multiracial character of our work and our leadership. So let me give you a little background on these three minority organizations. The United Construction Workers Association was founded in 1969 by a group of black workers led by Tyree Scott. 
to address the problems of racial discrimination in the building and construction trades. At the time, due to su such discrimination, there were less than 10 minority workers in all of Seattle's building trades, and no women, much less women of color. These workers publicly raised the issue and challenged the trades to allow black workers into their unions. And due to the political climate occurring in US society during the 60s and 70s, including the anti-war movement, the women's movement, the black power movement, and other student and people of color identity movements, and the struggle for Native Americans to assert their national sovereignty, the UCWA began to win broad-based support for their demands. And it is within the context of these various movements coming together that Tyree Scott would become aware of others who were fighting on the front lines of racial and economic struggles in their own communities. The next five slides are pictures of, um, maybe can move to the next, of uh, demonstrations in which construction sites, uh, the, the black workers and Asian workers and Latino workers and women would go to those construction sites to shut them down. They went to the airport, which you cannot do now because of the anti-terrorist laws in the United States, as they were building a third runway. I have the next one. And this is another shot of Tyree Scott. Um, I don't know how we all got so old, but <laughs> Tyree's like about 30 there. Um, and uh, this is also at the airport. You know, he's getting ready to get arrested. The next slide. Uh, this is him getting arrested at, I think this was at Seattle Central Community College where they were expanding the college. The next one. And this is at the U.S. Courthouse um, in one of the hearings that they were having uh, in which they were suing the trades for entrance into the trades. And the next one. Um, I think, and this was also at the courthouse. So you can see um, the workers, African-American workers, who fought to get into the trades and were victorious in eventually in getting into them. Um, and I think there's one more, yeah. This is in the Rainier Valley where they were doing um, construction. Rainier Valley is the home to, is in South Seattle, where they were um, uh, constructing new roads and new buildings in that area, and they shut those construction sites day after day as a sign that no one will work if black workers, Asian workers, and women cannot get those jobs. So that was happening during the 1960s and 70s. At the same time, UCWA leadership recognized that the workers must use all means available to them to combat racism in the trades especially as the white trade union leadership took a non-compromising position against the minority workers. UCWA quickly saw the major role that could be played by the courts in the wake of the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, particularly Title VII, which banned employment discrimination. They also realized that the law in and of itself would not protect workers from discrimination the workers must have access to the courts to challenge employers to obey the law. Yes, that would take lawyers. Yes, that would take lots of money and time. But UCWA saw that the workers would have to be vocal, militant, and visible, and most important, control the path the lawyers and funders would seek to accomplish what UCWA wanted. In 1969, as a result of UCWA's work, the U.S. Department of Justice brought suit against the five major mechanical trades in Seattle, the iron workers, sheet metal workers, plumbers and pipe fitters, electrical workers and operating engineers, and all of their apprenticeship programs. In the lawsuits, which were called U.S. versus Local 86 Iron Workers Union et al., the operating engineers settled before trial, and the 1970 decision found that the other unions were in violation of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. A series of court decrees were issued ordering the admission of a substantial number of blacks into the five trades. 
And in 1972, the United Construction Workers Association was made a party to the suit in order for them to participate in an administration and enforcement of various court decrees. In 20 years, mainly due to the work of UCWA in opening up the trades, over 500 people of color, including women, entered the trades. And today in Seattle, there are people of color in the leadership of some of the unions, including the president of the Electrical Workers Union, who is the first black man to head that union. Lilo also filed Yates versus Local 7 asbestos workers. This class action discrimination case was against the asbestos industry throughout Western Washington for its discrimination in admission to the apprenticeship program and in dispatching to job sites. At the time, the asbestos trade was among the highest paying in the construction industry, but never had one black apprentice before this case was filed. And in 1980, the case, the, ca the case was settled with the workers receiving $452,000 in damages and also attorney's fees and costs. Moreover, substantial goals and timetables were set for admitting minorities to the trade. As a result of UCWA's work in Seattle and Washington State, EOC granted funds for UCWA and LILO to do similar work in the South, where they assisted black workers in Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Oklahoma to organize Title VII employment discrimination suits. And as far as we know, LILO may be responsible for launching more successful Title VII cases than any organization in the country. But back in Seattle in the early 1970s, just as UCWA was organizing black workers and women around Title VII lawsuits, the Alaska cannery workers, Asian Pacific Islanders, Native Alaskans, and women were continuing their fight against the white owners of the salmon canning industry through the organization, the Alaska Cannery Workers Association. Although these workers were represented by a union, Local 37 of the ILWU, there was a sweetheart union led by Filipinos who failed to challenge blatant discrimination in employment, housing, and mess halls. The cannery, the cannery segregated white workers from workers of color, both in the housing and food mess halls. Workers of color received substandard housing compared to the newly constructed housing of the white workers. Workers of color received different food from the white workers. White workers got fresh fruit, steaks, cake, while the Filipinos and Native Alaskans got canned fruit cocktail, rice, and fish head soup. White workers were given the high paying and cleaner jobs, such as machinists, managers, and quality control inspectors. Filipino men cut and clean the guts from the salmon, some men working for up to 50 years in those same jobs the dirty and dangerous jobs with never an opportunity to move out of the jobs of butchering the salmon. And women were relegated to the egg house sorting the salmon eggs. With the monies won from the Seattle construction workers' cases, the Alaska cannery discrimination cases were launched. Lilo board members, Selmy Domingo and Michael Wu were sent to Alaska canneries under the guise of doing a university student research project. But what they were really doing were organizing cannery workers and cases there, which Lilo could use to sue the companies. While there, they met Jean Varnas, who, had led, who was leading a hunger strike of a different kind to protest that white workers in their own mess hall received better food than the minority workers got in their own segregated mess hall. So one day, Jean would tell the workers, don't eat any food all day. And then a few days later, he'd say, stuff your faces until you're so full you can't hardly move. And, then, and the company management became so concerned because they couldn't determine food allocations. And so they began to order better food for the Filipinos. Jean Varnas eventually joined the Alaska Cannery Workers and Lilo. And as a result of ACWA's research and outreach to cannery workers, 
Lilo filed three companion lawsuits in 1973. The first, Domingo versus New England Fish Company, was brought on behalf of 700 primarily Filipino and Alaska Native migrant workers and was the first reported case involving migrant seasonal workers. Claiming overt racial discrimination in segregated housing, segregated jobs, and mess halls, Lilo fought for over 14 years and finally obtained one of the largest favorable judgments in an employment discrimination case of that time. And in 1987, the case was settled for $4.65 million in damages and a million dollars in attorney fees and other costs. The second class action suit brought by Lilo against the Alaska canning industry was Carpenter, a native Alaskan, versus Nefco Fidalgo Packing Company. This lawsuit sought damages for racial discrimination in hiring, promotion, termination, housing, and messing. Lilo won $850,000 in damages for the workers and $250,000 in attorney's fees and costs. The court required the employer, among other things, to achieve 50% non-white participation in its upper level jobs for three consecutive years. Before I talk about the third cannery case, I want to talk about Lilo's work with Latino workers. Lilo's work attracted the attention of two students, two Latino brothers in Eastern Washington, the Trevino brothers. And Michael Fox, now a retired Superior Court judge in, in Seattle, before coming to work for Lilo as a lawyer, had done years of work with the UFW. And with, with the help of the Trevino brothers, Lilo filed Venegas versus the UFW of Washington. And this case involved the right of union organizers to enter a migrant labor camp against the wishes of the ranch owner and some anti-union residents. The UFW had been elected bargaining agent by a vote of 105 to 3, overwhelmingly in a secret ballot election agreed to by the UFW and employer. Contract talks had broken down, however, and when the union organizers tried to enter the camp in subsequent season, the ranch owner and some residents obtained an injunction on the grounds that union activity was an invasion of the residents' privacy. The injunction was dissolved, and the UFW's victory in lower court was affirmed by the Washington State of Court of Appeals. This case was an important national precedent in securing access of union organizers to migrant farm workers, further showing that Lilo wanted to work with those that were the most marginalized, many of those farm workers being undocumented farm workers. As you can see through the late 60s and even through the 80s, Lilo was able to use the Civil Rights Act to fight discrimination against workers of color and women. Combined with the brave actions of workers and a broad base of support, Lilo was able to win significant victories. But by the 80s, the changing political times brought on by the Re Ronald Reagan era, changes in the balance of forces in the courts, especially in the Supreme Court, and the receding of the social movements in the United States made it difficult to use the legal system, to use class action suits to accomplish Lilo's mission. The third class action lawsuit of the Alaska Cannery Workers exhibits this point. The case known as Antonio versus Ward's Cove, or just mainly as the Ward's Cove case, shows this. While this case was the same as the other two cannery lawsuits in terms of factual evidence and charges, after almost 30 years winding its way through the courts, the Ward's Cove case was lost. And it was a blow to the workers' legal rights. Even, and the Ward's Cove case went all the way to the US Supreme Court and in 1989, the, court, the U.S. Supreme Court issued an unfavorable decision that for the first time shifted the burden of proof about job discrimination from the employer to the employees and set a whole new standard for disparate impact cases. In the dissenting opinion written by Supreme Court Justice Stevens for the four justices in the case, can I have that? he wrote, some characteristics of the Alaska salmon industry described in this litigation, in particular, the segregation of housing and dining facilities 
and the stratification of jobs along racial and ethnic lines bear an unsettling resemblance to aspects of a plantation economy. Thus, he was comparing it to the days of slavery. And it, the other justice, Justice Blackman wrote, the salmon industry as described by this record takes us back to a kind of overt and institutionalized discrimination we have not dealt with in years. A total residential and work environment organized on principles of racial stratification and segregation. This industry has long been characterized by a taste for discrimination of the old-fashioned sort, a preference for hiring non-whites to fill its lowest level positions on the conditions that they stay here. Unfortunately, the Wards Cove case was one of the cases that contributed to the further dismantling of the civil rights of 65. And in 20 years, the gains marked by the Civil Rights Act of 1965 were already being undermined legally, starting with the Supreme Court as well as Congress. What the Wards Cove case signified to Lilo was that conditions had, had changed and Lilo had to look for other ways to fight for workers' rights. Over the two decades of filing and winning Title VII lawsuits, black workers, workers had shared their resources that API and Native workers could fight discrimination in the canneries. And the API Native workers shared their resources with Latino workers so that farm workers could be organized. This type of solidarity amongst workers showed that there would be no separate peace amongst workers. Lilo showed that unity could be built amongst workers of color across national and racial lines and that resources so important to the struggle against discrimination and for social justice could be shared to build that unity. You know, in that quote, uh, Aquan said, she closed by saying, all of us are in it together, all of us can do it together. And that really was Lilo's feeling and their work, and they exhibited all of that through the 40, 40, 40 years that have, they've existed. At its conception, in addition, Lilo saw that the struggle of workers' rights was integrally tied to the struggle of workers globally. While many viewed workers abroad as taking U.S. workers' jobs and pitting U.S. workers against workers in developing countries, Lilo saw that the global economy was forcing us to find common interests with workers abroad. The global economy was forcing us to see that there was no separate peace for workers in the U.S. and workers abroad. During LILO's formation and the formation of the three workers' rights organization who formed LILO, national liberation struggles were gaining victories in South Africa, in Asia, and Latin America. And during the 1980s, the struggle to support movements fighting dictatorships in the Philippines, El Salvador, Chile, all impacted the global thinking of people in the United States, especially in the left and in the communities of color. Lilo board members were at the forefront of the anti-apartheid struggle, the efforts to withdraw support for the dictatorship in Chile under General Augusto Pinochet, and of course, the struggle for democracy in the Philippines. In addition, Lilo has used its resources won through the lawsuits to support workers abroad in their fight for workers' rights and for economic recovery. In the 1980s, Lilo shifted to provide communications, economic and technical assistance to workers abroad. And in one of its most ambitious projects, Lilo provided technical assistance and machinery, such as brick making machines and water pumps in Mozambique, and worked with a revolutionary Mozambican organization dedicated to the developing and strengthening viable communities. The brick laying machines, the brick making machines, assisted in the building of warehouses for food that would otherwise rot, medical clinics, and housing. Other projects focused on Mozambique raised money for medical equipment, clothing, and technical training in the U.S. for Mozambicans and speaking tours of people from Mozambique to educate people about the struggle to rebuild a democratic and economically sustainable Mozambique after they won their freedom from the Portuguese. 
At one point, Lilo even embarked on an ambitious plan to resurrect a once viable cashew producing production. Very few people know that large, not a large amount of the cashews once came from Mozambique. Unfortunately, that plan failed despite Lilo sending Tyree Scott and his family to live in Mozambique for two years. Lilo also contributed money in the fight for justice in the murders of Salmi and Jean. It only seemed right that Lilo would contribute to the legal case and the massive movement building that sustained the justice efforts for almost a 10 year period in the aftermath of the murders, which resulted in the landmark case Domingo versus Marcos, which sued the Marcoses and others in the murder conspiracy. And as Davies said, in 1989, a federal court in Seattle ruled via a jury trial in favor of the Domingo and Vernas families in their charges that the Marcoses were responsible for the international murder conspiracy that resulted in Salmi and Jean's murders. The jury awarded the families $15 million in the first time ever a foreign head of state had been held liable in the United States for murders of US citizens. The case has been used in other cases trying to hold torturers and other heads of states for human rights violations around the world and has been an important deterrent in stopping those violators from coming to the United States for fear of also being sued. The families of Jean and Salmi set up the Domingo Vernis Justice Fund under Lilo's control out of some of the proceeds of the case, and the interest of that fund goes to support workers' struggles in the U.S. and abroad. In the late 1990s, Lilo launched, with the help of the Domingo Vernis Justice Fund, the International Worker to Worker Project to bring workers together to analyze their conditions living and working in a global economy and to develop strategies in light of unfair trade agreements and a new liberal agenda. In 1999, Lilo hosted 35 ordinary workers from 11 countries at Seebeck, Washington to begin the work of the Worker to Worker Project. Each worker spoke in their own languages, translated individually to the other workers, not through translation equipment, but by translators sitting next to, me, sitting next to the, that worker. From, there, from that came the Seebeck principles, principles that Lilo continues to abide by in their international work. Some of these principles have only now become more popularized such as the environment is a working class issue and its protection is not incompatible with jobs and development. And secondly, in the transformation of the global economy and privatization, it is women and children who suffer the most from the loss of the public sector and governmental protection for the least advantage. We also agree that the home is a workplace and that domestic violence should be considered a worker's issue. The CBIC meeting was followed by two other workers' meetings, one in Mexico City and the other in Brazil, forming a network of workers who are working to fight the impacts of unfair trade agreements, including privatization, the destruction of the workers' safety nets, dismantling of workers' rights protection and jobs, and the destruction of the people's environments, food, and culture. More recently, Lilo joined with the people from Mexico who were at the CBEC meeting in 99 to work on the Permanent People's Tribunal in Mexico. This was a two-year process originating from the People's Permanent Tribunal based in Italy that had put Henry Kissinger on trial for his role in the Vietnam War. The PPT in Mexico held hearings all over Mexico with two in the United States, to have people come forth from all walks of life, to talk about the impact of 20 years of living under the North America Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, and the destruction of their livelihoods, their culture, family, political structures, economy, and the violence that pervades their society. And it's a reminder, especially today, as, as Congress seeks to implement a similar trade agreement in Asia. Lilo hosted a hearing in Seattle to allow Mexican and Central Americans an opportunity to have their testimony included in that final report. And Lilo sent a delegation last no November to the final hearing, culminating the two years of hearings in Mexico. 
The final PPT report will be issued in English and will be an important document to provide context for the struggle for a new U.S. policy towards Mexico and the struggle for immigrant and refugee rights in the United States. The final piece of international worker to worker work that I wanted to talk about was our need to provide workers with an insight and education about alternatives to capitalism. It is with this idea that LILO incorporated work around Cuba and Venezuela into our work with a focus on the advancements of women's rights agenda in those countries under socialism. Since 2000, LILO has been home to the delegations of women that have gone to these countries, providing financial help, technical assistance, nonprofit status, and turn women from Cuba to educate others in this country about the reality of the lives of women populations under a socialist government. For many women of color, it is so important to see the positive alternatives that can transform the lives of women and children and the rest of the society once women are seen as equals in the transformation of a society. Today, LILO is home to the U.S. Women and Cuba Collaboration, an organization that I helped to lead that brings delegations of women to Cuba every year and a few men. And we are working actively to end the 54-year-old U.S. blockade against Cuba and ending that travel ban that prohibits free travel to Cuba, the only country that we as U.S. peoples cannot travel freely to in the world. While well, LILO has accomplished much in, the, in their history, there are many barriers to our continued work. We are currently in a transition of leadership to a younger generation, and we hope that they will understand the context for our work. They will understand our history and the need to organize workers. We hope that we can share our skills. We hope we can share our analysis and what it means to belong to a political organization and not just a nonprofit organization. We continue to have problems with funding of our projects. Unfortunately, we never got the $15 million that we want in the Domingo Veritas case. We got a small amount, but not anywhere near $15 million. And the sheer amount of work for a small staff of two and a board of, uh, we have seven people now, uh, three, of them, three of them are under 30, um, with the sheer amount of work that we have to do to change the world and such a small staff and board and even a small base, we face challenges in choosing what type of work we are going to do. Besides our Worker to Worker project, Lilo has many other projects. Our family wage jobs focus on livable wage jobs and struggling to get Sound Transit, which was a light rail project. Um, that is a multi-billion dollar project that in those neighborhoods that it crossed through, there were promises made in a project labor agreement to hire people of color and women. We are still, after 10 years, trying to hold them accountable to that promise. We have a relicensing project because we think that people who need to drive, they have a right to a driver's license and that there needs to be some attempt to lower the cost of insurance and to allow people to drive so they can pick up their children for daycare, they can go grocery shopping, and they can go to their jobs. We help 300 people a year through that relicensing project. We have a weekly radio program in Spanish to talk about the issues that face the Spanish-speaking community. We have ongoing work around immigration reform. We have sponsored um, the Friends of Akbayan who continue to raise money, who over the last year or so have raised almost $25,000 for the victims and for rebuilding in the, in the aftermath of, of the typhoon that devastated Leyte. And we also have Blue Corn Co-op, an organic food co-op with slow food cooking classes so that we can practice in our own lives a sustainable food and agriculture. And lastly, we still honor Salmi and Jean every year at our annual dinner in June so that we can remember those that sacrificed their lives in the struggle for workers' rights. So I invite you to come to Seattle to visit Lilo, to visit some of our projects. I also invite you 
Davey, <laughs> to Cuba, to come and see an alternative society. And that I want to thank you so much for asking me to come and speak, especially to Davey, who has appreciated Lilo's work and so much appreciated my work. But as I always think, it, it's just not one person that changes the world. It, ha it wasn't just me that helped lead the struggles. It was an organization, and it was a movement of people that I learned from and that I was a part of, and I feel so lucky to be part of that movement. So thank you for inviting me tonight. <laughs>